Hello everyone and welcome. In this episode, we are going to talk about what VXLAN is and how it can be leveraged as an overlay network option in Kubernetes. But since we are dealing with networking, uh, spe specifically Kubernetes networking, I want to make sure that you, everyone has um, some basic understanding of um, network in general before getting into uh, discussions of VXLAN and Kubernetes. For that, I'm going to talk about first um, about OSI, which stands for Open System Interconnect Model. Because you need to understand various layers in um, networking to understand um, and distinguish between various overlay networks, such as IP and IP, for instance, that operates in uh, layer three and VXLAN that operates in layer two. So what are layer two and layer three networking? I've, I've covered those in previous episodes, but in case if you missed those, I just want to make sure that you have some basic understanding of uh, what the OSI model is. Then we spend some time on uh, overview of what overlay, overlay networks, networks are and why do we need them. We'll then talk about VLAN because VXLAN is an extension or an improvement, if you like, over a VXLAN. So I, I want to make sure you understand what VLANs are. Then we jump into VXLAN. We'll take a look at overview and architecture and how it actually works. And finally, we put our knowledge into uh, work and we set up a Kubernetes, brand new Kubernetes network um, using Calico and we'll instruct Calico to use VXLAN. And then we do some network capturing to see what actually goes over the network when we use VXLAN. Hope you can join me. As mentioned in the intro, since we are dealing with Kubernetes networking, it really helps a lot if you understand um, what are the various layers of networking. And that's why I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about this. I've already talked about this in my other videos. If you have already watched that and you're familiar with it, then by all means, go ahead and skip. So the model that we are going to talk about is called the OSI or Open Systems Interconnect Model. It was developed back in the 70s to, as a standard for various uh, telecommunications and computer systems to be able to talk to each other. Originally, there were seven layers, although in the recent years, uh, layer five and six are no longer already being used. That's why I don't show them on the slide. Each layer has a layer number, a layer name, protocol, data unit, and addressing may or may not have some addressing scheme. So let's go through this together, starting from layer one at the bottom. So this layer one is called physical layer, and it literally is the medium through which the packets travel. It could be wired, such as cables. Um, the standard for that is 10 base T, or it could be Wi-Fi, wireless, and the standard for that is 802.11. The data unit is bits, and there is no Addison scheme. Layer two is called data link layer, the protocol is Ethernet, data unit um, are frames, and addressing is MAC address. So when you are in a local area network, when all the computers are in the same broadcast domain connected to a switch, then uh, the communications um, between them happens through Ethernet. Um, but uh, if the computer needs to talk to another computer which is in a different local area network or across the internet, then we need another layer in order to uh, facilitate that because Ethernet cannot go beyond a local area network. And that's why we have the network layer, which um, ensures that messages can travel from one local area network to another. The protocol is IP. The data unit is datagram and the addressing is IP address. Layer four is called the transport layer and the protocols are TCP and UDP. Data unit is segment and addressing is port. And this uh, layer is used when uh, client and 
server needs to talk, engage in a conversation, such as um, respond, request and respond. And that's the uh, layer that this conversation happens. Layer seven is called application layer, and the protocols are HTTP, HTTPS, SMTP, FTP, and a few others. Data unit um, are messages, and there is no addressing here. And this is basically the format that the client and the server agree to talk to each other when um, and it's really running on layer four. So in order to kind of make this a little bit uh, better understand, um, let's talk about an example. Let's say you live on an island and you want to send um, a letter to your friend and that friend happens to be on the same island. So that we, you go into the post office and you mail your letter. And then because you're in the same island, then the, uh, the mailman uh, uses the truck to deliver that uh, letter to your friend. And the frames really represent the, the, the packet, the, the, the envelope that you send. Let's say now that your friend, you have another friend that lives uh, on a different island. And obviously the local uh, mail carrier with his truck, it won't be able to uh, travel over water. So we need another medium in order to transfer the mail to the island that your friends live on. And uh, you, we use like boat, ship, you know, ferry, something like that to uh, transport uh, mail from one uh, island to another. And that is a network layer. It uh, connects all these islands together and ensures that communication happens among them. And let's say in that uh, mail that you're sending, in a letter that you're sending, you're telling your friend that I'll be calling you and I'll, buy, I'll be calling you on this uh, number, specific number. For instance, your uh, friend might have mo multiple telephone numbers. You specify which number you will be calling, and that will be the port you specify in the TCP connection or UDP connection. So that met method of communication, uh, like a telephone or instant messaging, that will be the transfer layer that you'll be talking, communicating with your friend. Also in that uh, mail, uh, that you le a letter that you send, you specify the language that you will be speaking. Let's say you're both bilingual, you know, French and English, but you say we standardize on English, so that was the protocol that you will be talking to, so that would be HTTP or SMPT. So I hope that this example makes that a little bit um, easier for you to understand various layers. VXLAN is an overlay network. So what is, the, what is an overlay network and why do we need them? Let's start with a simple example, a non-technical example. Let's say there are two castles that are uh, some a uh, few miles apart. And whenever this castle needs to send a message to this castle, normally they send somebody on horseback. Or let's say a man-eating monster has moved to that area. So it will be too dangerous to send somebody on horseback to deliver a message. So they need to come up with a different scheme. And that different scheme is to train pigeons that they can carry messages. So now pigeons can fly over the monster and deliver the message. So we are not really relying on this underlying uh, infrastructure here. We can fly over. And that's the whole idea of an overlay network. And that is in situations where you're not able to change the physical characteristics of a network in order to accommodate um, communication between two different segments, then we use overlay networks. So in this example, the monster is really the physical environment and network that we are not able to change. Uh, and this is very true in the virtualized world. In the, you know, when the VMs or containers are created on the fly, it will be too difficult or impossible to change the underlying network in order to accommodate communication between them. And that's where overlay networks uh, come into play. For a more technical example of what overlay networks are and what they are used for, let's assume we have two hosts. You have host A and host B here. And each host uh, within it is 
a network, a virtualized network. That, let's say two VMs or two containers over here hosted on this host, and two VMs or containers are hosted on top of this server here. And we want to find a way for these two isolated network to be able to communicate with each other. And we don't want to rip out our existing infrastructure in order to accommodate this. So we need to come up with a way and basically to provide a pipe that runs on top of the existing infrastructure and it can connect these two isolated uh, virtual networks. So how we implement that pipe is de really depends on what technology we use. And these uh, in Kubernetes, those are implemented through CNI or Container Network Interface. I've covered um, one method called IP and IP with Calico. Um, I, you can uh, click on link over here if you want to know, uh, know more about that. And there's another method called VXLAN. So in this talk, we're going to talk about VXLAN, how that works and how Overlay networks in Kubernetes work using VXLAN and Calico. Again, if you are interested in um, IP and IP, which is a different way of encapsulation and providing overlay networks, again, you can click on this notification here. Before diving into VXLAN, let's talk about virtual LAN or VLAN, because VXLAN is an extension to VLAN. VLAN logically connects groups of computers and other network devices regardless of their physical locations. It improves security, reduces network congestions, and simplifies traffic and network management. So let's say we have a LAN here, like local area network. We have a switch, and we have a number of computers here. So let's look at our requirements up here. So let's say we want to segregate these computers based on their area of um, their operation. For instance, billing, shipping, IT, security, and so on. And the other thing that we want to do is, uh, because all these computers are on the same um, switch, when computer one wants to talk to computer four, in order to find its MAC address, it needs to send what is known as ARP broadcast or address resolution protocol. And it sends it to every computer on this switch. So if there are you know, like hundreds of computers, you can see that it quickly overwhelms the network uh, because each computer needs to talk to other computer for different reasons. Um, then we have a problem because this uh, network will be very congested. So what we could do is if this uh, switch is manageable, that is if we can program it, we can create um, isolated VLAN or virtual LANs and assign different ports to it. For instance, now we have a VLAN for these two computers. We can also create another segmentation or VLAN, VLAN 2, and let's say we assign these two computers to it, and we create another one, VLAN 3, and assign these two. So now, these are segmented. There are um, as if they're on a totally different networks and they can directly talk to each other. And let's say if this computer wants to send an ARP, it only are send the ARP to the same VLAN that it belongs to. So that reduces the, the congestion that we talked about earlier. As uh, stated earlier, a VXLAN is an extension to VLAN. It was designed to provide the same VLAN functionality with greater uh, extensibility and flexibility. One of the flexibility is we can extend our a layer two segment over an existing uh, underlying infrastructure. Also, and this is a great one, it gives us a, a lot more segments. So VXLAN uses a 24-bit segment ID known as VXLAN Network Identifier, or VNI, which enables up to 16 million VXLAN segments, and that is compared to only 4,095 in VLAN. So as you can see, in the virtualized world, 4,000 
VLANs, uh, you know, especially if you're in a cloud situation, is not really that many. Um, so we extend, we can go up to 16 million uh, segments per administrative domain. So here we'll show um, VLAN has a VLAN ID and this field is 20 bits. So it's like two to the power of 12. VXLAN, however, this field, the VNI, which is uh, equivalent to uh, VLAN ID, is 24 bit, 24 bits. So it, the capacity is 222 to the power of 24. In the introduction to overlay network uh, slide, we mentioned that overlay networks, depending on what algorithm, what type of VX time we use, they provide a pipe between um, a method of communication between two segment network. So let's talk specifically how VXLAN accomplishes this. So first of all, VXLAN depends on a special type of switch called a VTEP or VXLAN internal point switch. So this could be virtual or could be uh, physical. So in our case, we are talking about containers and Kubernetes, this will be virtual. And then they provide the bridge between layer two and layer three networks and provide um, encapsulation and decapsulation. And I'll talk about that in the next animation. It also, between these two, we, uh, they create a UDP tunnel and that is our pipe that is now connecting these two segmented network. And they all run on top of an existing L3 network. So we don't have to make any changes to our L3 network that runs um, in the underlying uh, connection of this uh, set up. In the next set of animations and slides, you're going to take a look at use cases for VXLAN and how actually VXLAN works in action. The first use case, we are going to take a look at situations where we want to extend our L2 from one location to another, let's say from one data center to another data center. And in the second use case, we are going to take a look at actually uh, Kubernetes and see how its uh, CNI provider, uh, such as Calico, takes advantage of uh, VXLAN to provide uh, connectivity between segments uh, or uh, pod networks that are created on different servers and how it provides connectivity to the outside world. Um, so let's start with the first case. Let's say we have a company in Minneapolis with a data center here, and then we set up a VLAN, and then we add a bunch of VMs to it. Then we open another data center in Denver, and now we want to move some of our assets from this data center to the other. Um, but we don't want to make any changes to the IP address. Um, the, in the past, the only way to do this would have been to set up an L2 private circuit between these two data centers and then move whatever assets that we need to move to the other side. This works. The, the only problem and the big problem here is because the gateway still is on in Minneapolis data center. Then for any communication from outside world, they would have had to travel through the L2 circuit back to this data center and then come back here again. So that would, would um, not very fast and very time consuming. But now with VXLAN, uh, they could set up VXLAN between these two data centers and basically set up two VTEP on in the, um, either side. So again, VTEP stands for Virtual Terminal Endpoint. It's basically a, a special kind of switch that provides connectivity, that provides a bridge between L2 and L3 networks. So uh, right now we have, and um, so the UDP tunnel uh, is shown here as always on. That's not the case, this is for illustration purposes. We only uh, turn on UDP tunnel when these two are in communication. So it's kind of keep that in mind. So let's say now uh, walk through a scenario where one um, PC from here, one or a VM wants to talk to another VM over here. Let's say we, uh, we want to ping this server over here, this VM from here, and let's go through the process of how that happens. So the first thing that this uh, VM needs to do is it needs to get the 
MAC address of the other VM. It, it knows his uh, IP address, but it doesn't know the MAC address. And that's where ARP or address resolution protocol comes into play. So it need, um, this v, uh, VM needs to create a, an ARP request. And so it starts by adding the required information. So it puts its own um, source MAC address, the IP address of the server the, or VMs that it wants to find its MAC address. And the destination MAC address obviously doesn't know. So it puts all F. So when you put all F in the destination MAC address, that will trigger an ARP request. So this request will go to all the VMs on this side, and then also through this tunnel, through this VTAP. Um, so the VTAP encapsulates the frame in a VXLAN and IP header and forward it to the other uh, VTAP. So in this case, we only have only one VTAP. So it basically forward this um, ARP request to the other side. Um, so now this uh, PC's uh, request, um, response, oh yeah, I got um, that IP address and uh, I have the MAC address that you're <coughs> looking for. So it puts the destination MAC address as the destination MAC address of this VM. And then the, the, the source MAC address obviously is its own MAC address. And in the data section of ARP, it puts its um, MAC address because that's what the other uh, VMs is requesting. And then it sends it through the um, VTAP again, it ends up on the other side. And now this PC or VM has the MAC address of uh, the other VM. Now it can start working, actually creating um, a request to uh, ping the other server. So start um, creating uh, appropriate um, requests. The first one is an ethernet frame. So it creates an ethernet frame. The, the source would be itself, and the destination is the MAC address that it's got from the other server over here. It also um, then adds an IP header. The source, again, it's itself, and the destination is the other uh, VM. It also, then uh, inside that, it uh, requests the um, ping request. And then it sends it out, and it this will be intercepted by VTAP because it has to go now travel to the other side. And then VTAP needs to add extra information because now it has to send from this side to the other side. So it needs to create another um, outer um, Ethernet. The source would be the source, uh, the, I, the MAC address of itself, and the destination would be the um, destination, the MAC address of the other VTAP on the other side. It also uh, needs to create an IP header. Again, the source address would be itself and the destination would be the other side. And then within that, it uh, create a UDP header because now we have to set up a UDP tunnel for data exchange. And within that, it adds another header. This is for VXLAN. And, for, and it adds some information such as VNI, uh, the, like the VNI number, um, because this will need to ensure that it only responds to the VNI uh, that are, it's set up to communicate with. And then it finally adds the original uh, Ethernet frame and IP header that it created, that, that PC created, puts everything in one um, Ethernet and it's, uh, packet and sends it over through the UDP tunnel to the other side. And now if this VTAP uh, intercepts that and then it reads the information and it makes sure that uh, it's, it's addressed to, it, to itself and makes sure that um, the VNI that uh, it, uh, this request is coming from, uh, it's valid and it's supposed to answer that. And then it kind of strips out those information that it doesn't really need anymore. And it's all it's left with now is the original request that it, ping request that this PC or VM created and forward that to this PC or VM. And then this VM then responds and goes through the same process. It needs to create 
Ethernet header and then you know Ethernet frame and um, IP header and so on. But exactly very similar to the um, to the process that we just described, and then sent back through the tunnel and then uh, finally they get the result back that uh, this the ping is successful. Now let's see how VXLAN is being uh, leveraged as an overlay network option um, when you set up Kubernetes. So uh, when you set up uh, Kubernetes, you have to make some decisions, and one of which is what uh, CNI provider or uh, container network interface provider you need to, to select. Because um, by default, Kubernetes does not provide pod network. It really depends on um, CNI providers, and there are a bunch of them out there that you can choose from. But more importantly, is you need to decide <coughs> what kind of overlay network, what kind of encapsulation is, um, would work better for your situation. So in this scenario, we're talking about VXLAN. I've already, like I said before, um, I covered IP and IP in a different video. But for this, we are going to select um, or assume that we are going with Calico. And you're going to select VXLAN as the, the overlay network option. And during the demo, I'll show you <coughs> how to set up uh, Calico and how to instruct it to use um, VXLAN as the overlay network. But let, let's assume that we have already set up our cluster. So when you set up the, the cluster and you install Calico and it, you tell it to use VXLAN, it will install VTEP. Or, or VXLAN ter uh, terminal endpoint <coughs> on all the um, Kubernetes cluster um, members, uh, uh, worker nodes, and master. And it, the, it's called them, all of them, VXLAN.calico. <coughs> so th this is a scenario. So we have this cluster set up. Let's go through the process of, let's say we deploy um, a pod. So this is our deployment. A kubectl create deployment, and we call it hello world, and then we get the image from this location. This is basically a hello world application. <coughs> and this application, once installed, will be listening on port 8080. So the request goes to control plane, the API server, then it instructs a kubelet, kubelet then calls into CRI, which is container runtime interface, <coughs> which um, gets the um, the image from whatever library. In this case, let's say is in uh, uh, Docker Hub. It downloads the image and actually creates the container here, and then CRI calls into CNI or CNI or Container Network Interface plugin. It calls into that, and CNI actually creates the uh, uh, namespace for it the network namespace, and also sets up um, the VET pairs. So VET stands for Virtual Ethernet. So it set up two um, adapters, one on the client, on, on the pod itself. And then it also adds a kind of counterpart on the server and set up a communication pipe between them. And that would um, enable pods to communicate with the outside world. It also assigns an IP address. <coughs> and at this point now, we, our service is up and running. So this is a hello world service um, listening on port 8080. And finally, CNI <coughs> also sets the default route for the, um, for the pod. Now let's say we want to um, now that we have the service set up here, let's say we want to um, call into it from the master node. So we are calling uh, into the service, web service, um, on, which is hosted on the pod from outside this server here. So let's say we do curl HTTP, and then we call directly into the um, pod here. And then on port 8080, so that's the service is running on. Let's see what happens next. It will then, the request goes to uh, the VET on this side, then goes through the uh, L3 network, and then sets up the UTP um, communication between these two. And then finally, 
um, calls a web service, and the results uh, come back. So this kind of a uh, overview of how this communication happens from um, outside the pod um, when you're using uh, VXLAN. In this section, we are going to walk through the process of setting up a brand new Kubernetes cluster um, using Calico, and also we will instruct Calico to use um, VXLAN instead of IP and IP as the overlay network. So by default, Calico uses IP and IP, but we don't want that to do that in this case. We want to make sure it uses VXLAN. So let's go through the process. Obviously, you want to make sure that you have the latest version of our uh, Linux. So line 11 and 12, you want to make sure you have the latest version of whatever distribution that you are installing. Um, I'm using Ubuntu for this demo. And then we need to install also a container manager on line 15. Um, so I'm using container D. I wouldn't recommend Docker anymore. Uh, so you either use container D or some other approved container manager. And then the rest of this uh, is basically installing the required prerequisite, uh, such as getting the uh, Kubernetes key um, on your system, um, and then also installing things such as kubeadm, um, kubelet, and kubectl. Those are required for managing the cluster. And also, there are some sections for, um, as far as networking is concerned, to make sure that the IP forwarding is enabled and, and so on. So all I've um, commented um, everything here for you so you understand what's going on. And I've already walked that through the process, you know, in previous uh, episodes. So I don't want to spend more time going through that. So all you need is just go through this and install everything that is uh, listed here. Then on uh, line, um, on section on line 57, this is a section that you only run on the master. And on line 59, this is the line that actually is going to initiate the cluster. So sudo k, um, k cube ADM in it, that would install a Kubernetes and configure that uh, as a bare bone Kubernetes on your uh, master. And then on line 61, we need to create a a folder or file um, uh, um, uh, or a folder called um, cube and that is a hidden, hidden folder um, so make, make sure you do that and then copy the content of this uh, folder um, under etc kubernetes dash admin dot conf so this um, has all the certificates needed to connect to your a new um, Kubernetes cluster, you need to copy that to the folder we just have created a uh, line before. And that will allow you to now run kubectl commands and manage the cluster. On line 63, we um, give it appropriate permission so you'll be able to um, access that. And then on line 66, this is actually the meat of this section. And this is, we, we need to download the Calico um, installation file for to install Calico, but we need to modify that. So I'm downloading that, put it in, um, putting it in the local file called calico.yaml. And these are the things that are modifications that we need to do to that file. Um, we need to set the Calico backend to VXLAN. We need to comment out this section, um, which is dash dash bird uh, dash live and also comment this dash dash bird ready so bird is the bgp or border gateway protocol uh, agent that runs on um, um, calico node or in kubernetes since we are not using ip and ip uh, we don't need this so you can just disable that and um, you can leave it on as you want but just uh, add a little bit of overhead to your network and then on line uh, um, 72, this is the important part here. We need to set the uh, Calico 
underscore IPv4 pool underscore VXLAN. And then we need to set the value to always. And conversely, calico underscore IP uh, v4 pool underscore IP and IP. We need to set this to never. So, and by doing this, then Calico will be uh, forced to uh, use VXLAN and uh, use VXLAN as overlay network. So, by default, uh, IPv4, uh, IP and IP is enabled and this is disabled. So, we need to kind of flip that. And I pre um, prepared a um, a calico.yaml file that I've in included in the download. You can download that and run it. And I have um, comment, um, put a comment, whenever I made a change, I commented with the learning channel. So look for the learning channel and you will see the changes that I've made here. For instance, in calico backend, I set it to the extent originally was BERT. So we need to change that to BERT and, and then go to the next one. Um, here, calico underscore IPv4 pool underscore VXLAN, and the value is always. And the other one, uh, calico um, underscore IPv4 pool underscore IP and IP, and the value is never. And then these are uh, the birds uh, uh, section. So this is commented out, this is also commented out. So you can use this if you like. Um, and then use it as is, and then we need to then uh, on line 81, we need to apply this calico.yaml file. Let's go ahead and run that. And it goes through the ins installation process and it's actually pretty quick. So uh, it will set up everything required for calico to function as our CNI or container network interface provider. And then on line 84, um, optionally, you can copy the content of the hidden file cube that we created earlier, and then you copy it to uh, other nodes. And so you'll be able to run kubectl commands from other um, places, um, so other nodes. And finally, uh, we need to run this on line 87. Um, once you install, Calico on, on the master node, it will give you a, a key um, or instructions how to set up. Um, so you need to copy um, the instruction that it gives you to join other nodes to the cluster. So just pay, pay attention when you run install setup, uh, run the init on the master. At the end, it gives you an instruction to join, how to join uh, other nodes to your uh, cluster. That will be includes a certificate. So you need to copy that instruction that they provided to you and run that on other nodes that you want to set up. So I'm going to go ahead and set up my, um, I'll set up another node and then um, I will come back here and then start actually uh, exploring how uh, Calico uh, VXLAN, uh, Calico overlay network in VXLAN work. So I installed um, Calico prerequisites on the other node, node one, and I also joined it to the cluster. So we can verify that on line 100, kubectl get nodes minus OY. So let's go ahead and run that. And we'll see that we have two nodes, the master and node one. So, and then optionally, if you want, you can untaint the master. So what does that mean? By default, you cannot uh, schedule pods on, on master. It, it only, you can only schedule on uh, other nodes. But if, if you have a small cluster like mine, I have only like a couple of servers, we can untaint master. That is uh, the command on line 103 will allow you to install pods on master as well. So I've already done that. But that's up to you. It's it's very it's optional. Um, and then on line one hundred seven, IP link show type VXLAN. So uh, v, type VXLAN is actually a type in Linux. So we can take a look at um, see what's installed, and we'll see that VX uh, v, uh, VXLAN dot Calico 
Uh, so this is basically the VTEP or virtual um, or VXLAN terminal endpoint. And that is the name of it is called VXLAN.calico. We mentioned that during the uh, presentation also. We can also get the IP address. So this VTEP will have an IP address. So on, on line one, uh, 110, IP ADDR, and then we grab with VXLAN.calico. Uh, so let's go ahead and run that. And we can see that this is VXLAN Calico, and this is the IP address of uh, our VTEP. So again, rem remember, VTEP is, is a special kind of switch that um, connects um, L3 and L2 networks. So it has a L3 IP address as well. So let's do some testing and on line 113, we are going to install um, a Hello World application. Again, that's what we discussed during the presentation. So kubectl create deployment. We call it Hello World and we get the image from this location. Let's go ahead and run that. Let me see that created. Now let's um, on line 115, uh, so let's scale it to two parts so we have one pod installed on master and the other pod on node, uh, node one. And then we can verify that on line 118. kubectl get pods minus O wide. And these are our two pods. One is installed on node one and the other one on master. Um, now we want to extract the IP address of um, the one that is on node, uh, node one. That is. The IP, this one, because we want to um, directly call the service on it. So, and that is on um, line 121. So I put it in a variable called pod underscore IP underscore on underscore node one. So basically we want to get the IP address of the pod that is running on node one. So this is a uh, kubectl get uh, pod minus O wide. And then we grab it into um, uh, cube node one because you're only interested in getting the, this IP address. And then we strip everything and then we get the, uh, we look for the positional parameter, um, which is I, six, which is the IP address of the, um, of the pods. Let's go ahead and run that. And then we can echo that out on line 122. So we get, this is the IP address of um, the pod. So the reason why I'm doing this because we are going to later, a little bit later on, um, do a, a network dump and see what's going on on uh, over the wire when we call um, a pod from one server which is hosted on another server, and we we'll see how that goes through the whole UDP pipe and a VXLAN and how that kind of uh, works. So for now, on line on one. Uh, 24, kubectl, uh, oh sorry, curl, curl um, HTTP bond, the IP address of the pod one, that uh, the pod on uh, node one, and then we call the service which is listening on port 8080. Let's go and run that, and we get the response from the pod, which is on the other node, it's a hello world, and this is the version number and the, the name of the pod. So let me clear that. And we are going to run the same command again, the curl, but this time we are going to capture the communication between um, server uh, master one and node one. And for that, we are going to run a utility card T-Shark so we can install T-Shark on your computer. And then um, this is the uh, switches minus I means um, on what it, um, interface it, it, it's going to listen on. And we are going to listen on at zero. And then minus C means how should uh, VLXLAN interpret the communication. So we say that anything that is coming from UDP port uh, 4789, uh, remember for um, VXLAN uses um, UDP port 489. And we, so we are instructing um, t -Shark to interpret any communication from 4789 uh, as VXLAN traffic, um, and uh, T-Shark knows about VXLAN. And minus F port 4879, uh, we are only interested in 
uh, the traffic that's coming from that particular port. Let's go ahead and run that and let's come back here and let us run the command again on line 124 curl. And we go back to the command line and we'll see that it captured the communication between these two servers. So let's go ahead and go from the beginning and take a look at what's, what's happening over the wire. So there's a lot of stuff going on here and it basically starts from here. Um, so this is the ethernet from, this is the other um, ethernet um, packet um, from server uh, for master. So this is the MAC address of master and this is the MAC address destination is the MAC address of node one. So you recall that VXLAN creates an other um, frame that then puts everything inside that. So that is the other um, frame, Ethernet frame, and then inside that it also creates an IP a header and a packet. So this is that part and the source again is um, from a, a master and the destination is node one. And then the next part is the UDP part. So let's go ahead and scroll down a little bit. So this is request for establishing the pipe, the UDP pipe between um, VTEP on master and VTEP on node one. As you can see, it says the destination port is uh, 4789. And then within that, then it also creates another header and this is the VXLAN um, header. And then we'll see that the VXLAN network um, identifier VNI is 4096. And then within that then is the original ethernet frame. And then again, it also creates uh, original IP header within that. And then within that then is the request for, because we are calling a web service. So this is a TCP request that is calling on port um, 8080. So that's the um, information related, related to TCP. So this is now going from one server to the other. And then when the, on, from the other side, when the results are ready, this is the information now it's sending, um, the node one is sending back to send your result back to uh, master. And now things are reversed. So this is the MAC address of node one. And this is, this is the source and the destination is the MAC address of uh, master. And, then, and again, within that, it creates an IP header but again, everything is reverse. Now the source is the uh, node one and destination is mass, uh, master. So as you can see, it's just uh, everything kind of is reverse now because now it's sending the result back to server one. So this is how uh, VXLAN, the whole overlay networking works in um, uh, Kubernetes. So I hope this was useful and helpful. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please make sure to post them and I will try my best to read all of them and answer. Thank you very much and hope to talk to you soon.